Welcome back to Deep Learning. So today I want to talk a bit about the actual visualization techniques that allow you to understand what's happening inside a deep neural network. Okay, so let's try to figure out what's happening inside the networks. And we'll start with the simple parameter visualization. This is essentially the easiest technique. We've already worked with this in previous videos. So the idea is that you can plot the learned filter weights directly and it's easy to implement. It's also easy to interpret for the first layer. Here you see some example for the first layer filters in AlexNet. And if you see very noisy first layers, then you can probably already guess that there's something wrong. So for example, you're picking up the noise characteristic of a specific sensor. Hello, Neil. Who are you? I am the architect. I created the matrix. I've been waiting for you. Apart from that, it's mostly uninteresting because, well, you can see that they take the shape of edge and Gabor filters, but it doesn't tell you really what's happening in later parts of the network. And if you have small kernels, then you can probably still interpret them. But if you go deeper, you would have to understand what's already happening in the first layers. So they somehow stack and you can't understand what's really happening inside the deeper layers. You have many questions, and though the process has altered your consciousness, you remain irrevocably human. Ergo, some of my answers you will understand, and some of them you will not. So we need some different ideas, and one idea is that they visualize the activations. So the kernels are difficult to interpret, so we look at the activations that are generated by the kernels, because they tell us what the network is computing from a specific input. So if you have a strong response, it probably means that the feature is present, even if you have a weaker response, the feature is probably absent. So how does this look like? Yeah, for the first layer, you can see that the activations then look like normal filter responses. So you see here the input and then filter zero and filter one. You can see that they somehow filter the image. And of course, you can then proceed and look at the activations of deeper layers and then you already realize that looking at the activations may be somehow interesting, but the activation maps by the downsampling typically lose resolution very quickly. So this means that you then can visualize only very coarse activation maps. So here you see a visualization that may correspond maybe to face detection or face-like features. And then we can start speculating what this kind of feature is actually representing inside the deep network. There's the deep visualization toolbox that I have in reference 25, and it's online available and it allows you to compute things like that. Well, the drawback is of course that we don't get precise information why that specific neuron was activated or why this feature map takes this shape. Concurrently, while your first question may be the most pertinent, you may or may not realize it is also the most irrelevant. Well, what else can we do? We can investigate features via occlusion. And the idea here is that you move a masking patch around the input image. And with this patch, then you kind of remove information from the image. And then you try to visualize the confidence for a specific decision with respect to the different positions of this occluding patch. And then, of course, areas where the patch caused a large drop in confidence is probably an area that is related to the specific classification. So we have some example here. We have this patch that we mask, the original input on the left, the two different versions of masking on the right. And then you can see that the reduction in confidence for the number three is much larger in the center image than on the right hand side image. So we can try to identify confounds or wrong focus with these kind of techniques. And let's look at some more examples. 
Here you see the Pomeranian image on the top left and the important part of the image is really located in the center. If you start occluding the center, then also the confidence for the class Pomeranian will go down. In the middle column, you see the true label car wheel and the corresponding image and on the bottom the confidence and here you can see that if you hide the car wheel then of course the confidence drops but also if you start hiding parts of the advertisements on the car then also the confidence drops so this is a kind of confounder that was probably learned that a car wheel may be in close collocation to such other parts of the image even including advertisements. Here on the right you see the true label Afghan Hound and if you start occluding the dog of course then the confidence actually breaks down and the person on the top left for example is completely unrelated but also covering the face of the owner or seeming owner also causes a reduction in the classification rate. So you might argue that dog owners start to become similar to their dogs. No, this is also a confounder. Why am I here? Your life is the sum of a remainder of an unbalanced equation inherent to the programming of the matrix. You are the eventuality of an anomaly which, despite my sincerest efforts, I have been unable to eliminate from what is otherwise a harmony of mathematical precision. Well, let's look into a third technique. Here we want to find the maximal activation of specific layers or neurons. And the idea here is that we just look at the patches that have been shown to a network and we order them by confidence in a specific neuron. And what you can then generate are sequences like this one. So you see that this specific neuron has been activated with 0 0.1, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.8, and you can see these were the patches that were maximally activating this neuron. So you could argue, well, is this a dark face detector or is it a dark spot detector? So you could very easily figure out what the false friends are, and this is comparatively easy to find, but the drawback is, of course, that you don't necessarily get a semantic meaning by themselves. You could argue that this forms rather base vectors of representation. Here we have another example and you could say, well, what kind of detector is this? A red flowers and tomato sauce detector? Or is this a detector for specular highlights? Well, at least you can figure out which neuron is related to what kind of input. So you kind of get some feeling what's happening in the network and which things cluster together. While it remains a burden assiduously avoided, it is not unexpected and thus not beyond a measure of control, which has led you inexorably here. You haven't answered my question. Quite right. Interesting. I was quicker than the others. Speaking of clustering, uh, then you can also actually use the clustering of inputs to visualize how similar different inputs are for a specific deep network. And this is the T stochastic neighborhood embedding visualization technique. And now here the idea is that you compute the activations of the last layer and group the inputs with respect to their similarity in the last layer activation. So you essentially perform a dimensionality reduction of the last layer activations because these are the ones that are relevant for the classification and are likely to encode the feature representation of your network, of your trained network. And then you actually perform this dimensionality reduction technique and produce a 2D map and this allows you to see what your network things are similar inputs. So 
This is, of course, an embedding of a very high dimensional space in 2D. So there's, of course, a lot of loss of information if you do this. Still, the technique is very interesting. And if I zoom in into different parts here, you can see that we actually form clusters of different categories in this kind of dimensionality reduction. So you can see that images that are perceived similar by the neural network are also located in a direct neighborhood in the dimensionality reduced representation. And actually, if you look at those neighborhoods, they kind of make sense. So this is actually something that helps us to understand and develop confidence in the feature extraction that our deep neural network is doing. Others? How many? Others? What are there? The matrix is older than you know. In the 80s, I thought about how to build this machine that learns to solve all these problems. There are only two possible explanations. There were five ones before. Either no one told me, or no one knows. Precisely. So, Next time in deep learning, we want to talk about more visualization methods. And in particular, we want to look into gradient-based procedures. So we want to use kind of backpropagation type of ideas in order to create visualizations. And the other one is optimization-based techniques. And here we are actually very close to what we've already seen in the adversarial examples. So thank you very much for listening and see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Bullshit. Bullshit. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. But rest assured, this will be the sixth time we have destroyed it. And we have become exceedingly efficient at it. There's no notion of evil in that, in that context, other than the fact that people die. Mm -hmm.